Come on, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I don't know what you came to do this morning, but I came to bless the name of the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He did it. Come on, remember where God brought you from. He healed me. He delivered me. He brought me up out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock today. And that is the reason why I can say that he did it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the name of the Lord. Well, it's so glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Hallelujah, to give God all that is due unto his name. First, giving honor to God who is the head of my life. I thank God for all that he is to me. I thank God for the angels of this house who are tuned in with us this morning. Pastors Reggie and Pastor uh, Ken Kendi Stewart. Let's give God a thanks and praise for them. Hallelujah. I thank God for my space here over, over about two months. They have done a phenomenal job. I thank God for their investment in my life over these weeks. It has truly been impactful. I thank God for all the leadership of this house, all the ministers, elders, and other pastors. I thank God for you. And I thank God for you, the saints of the Most High God, for your space here this morning. It is a privilege to share with you this morning. So as I go into this word, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time to stand before your people. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and my redeemer. Amen and amen. Well, you may be seated on this morning. What a powerful um, um, song that the praise team did. Didn't they do a wonderful job this morning? Yes, and all the musicians and everyone that have a part to play, we thank God for you. Well, if you have your Bibles, which I would hope that you have in the house of God this morning, let's turn to the book of Luke chapter 14. Verses 16 to 23. And I would love it if I could have the timer in the back for me. Thank you all so much. Luke chapter 14. Verses 16 through 23. Amen. Then he said unto him, a certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have brought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed, and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto his servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Look to your neighbor and say, Neighbor, that my house may be filled. There is no doubt that we are truly living in perilous times. It is all over our news stations, newspapers, and social media feeds. 
every day there is some tragedy happening, some major world catastrophe. The frequentness of these events is very alarming. It was spoken in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that these times would come. But who would have imagined that we would be the generation living through it? The love for God, his church, and each other has waxed cold among many people. People no longer revere the sacred. Their conscience has been said with a hot iron. People are hurting, battered, depressed, and have lost hope. The pressures of this life have taken their toll on so many. Some people even believe that this life is not worth living. But as sad as this may be, there is much greater concern for me, which should be for everyone here. There are far more lost souls going to a Christless hell every day. There are far more lost souls roaming our streets with no fear of where they will end up should they die today. There are far more lost souls comfortable in their sin, banking on a loving God who will accept their excuses on Judgment Day. Saints of God, may I remind us that this is a serious hour, and we must not become like those who are sleeping. We must not become comfortable in our church's padded pews, air conditioning, fancy chandeliers, and stained glass windows. We must not become comfortable in our perceived obligation that we must come to church every Sunday, but I'm afraid that we have become comfortable. Do you want to know how I know that we have become comfortable? Look around this building. There are still empty seats. Have our hearts become calloused and numb to this sight every Sunday? Have we become so used to sitting in our usual Sunday seats and seeing the same people every Sunday? Have we no care that someone went to hell while we were just worshiping that he did it? Do you want to know how I know that we have become comfortable? Because we went through this whole week without praying for someone, without offering Jesus to someone, without inviting someone to church. Have our hearts become callous and numb that we can honestly lift our hands in worship without repenting to God for refusing to be a light in this dark world? Have our hearts become callous and numb that we think it not strange or unusual that there was no rejoicing in heaven because of a soul we led to Jesus. Why do we come to church? Why do we gather every Sunday? What is the purpose of our assembling? Who are we leading into the presence of God? If there are no lost souls in the building, then who are we leading into his presence? We should not have to, believe, have to lead believers into God's presence because his presence lives within us, right? So who are we preaching to? What is our preaching if not one soul comes to Jesus? So in this passage here in Luke chapter 14, we see in verses 16 to 20, where there was this great dinner party. The host invited all his friends to join. We can imagine the great preparations that were made leading up to the date. We can imagine how many people were involved in the planning process of this event. The Bible says that this was a great supper, which tells us that this was not any typical gathering. This would not be a birthday party at McDonald's or, birthday or Burger King. This was the real deal right here. However, as they were about to begin festivities, all the guesses, excuses began pouring in. How many of us can relate to this? We plan a special event, make sure people reserve their spot, and somehow their seat becomes empty. Now suddenly they have to bake cookies for Santa Claus even though it's summertime. But isn't that just like us? God is inviting us to do his purpose in the earth, yet we find every excuse as to why we cannot do it. 
even as I was asking those questions a few moments ago, I know some of us were trying to justify why I couldn't pray for someone, why we couldn't pray for somebody this week. We love making excuses because we do not want to be held accountable. We love making excuses because we do not want to bear the responsibility of our failed actions. We love making excuses because we want to be lazy. When God told Moses to speak to Pharaoh, Moses made the excuse, well, God, I am unable to speak properly. When God called Jeremiah, Jeremiah made the excuse of, I'm just too young. Esther made the excuse to Mordecai as to why she could not go before the king. But how many of us know that excuses are no longer acceptable when we sign up for this Christian journey? Excuses are no longer acceptable when we accepted Jesus into our hearts. Because when we accepted Jesus into our hearts, we enlisted into the army of the Lord. God is not looking for our excuses, but he is looking for our obedience, availability, and willingness. We must recognize that God is not desperate for us. God isn't harder for us. God's work is not going to go undone because of our excuses. Like Mordecai said to Esther, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. From another place. So God's work will be done with or without us. But we should feel honored that God would invite us to be a part of his mission on earth. Another thing that is important to note here is that this man invited people who already have something going for themselves. He invited someone with this property, he invited this lady or this man who, you know, had a wife to attend to. Those people already had status. They already had their foot in the door. But we, too, want to invite those who already, who we already know have their lives going together. We have no problem speaking to the company CEO, but we would walk right past the janitor. We have no problem going up to pastor after service, but would not speak to the person we sat to next to service. We have no problem talking to our church sister or our church brother about how service went, but we would not share Jesus with the waiter at the restaurant. We have no problem having revivals and conferences, would, but, but would not invite the homeless man off the street into the house of God. If all our revivals and conferences are filled with believers, then who exactly are we preaching to? Jesus said that they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Yet we continue these services while the sick are still on the streets. So this man's friends bailed on him. But he would not allow all their hard work to be wasted. He told his servant to go out into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor, the deaf, the paralyzed, the blind, the deaf, the mute, and anyone he could find. But how many of us are doing this today? How many of us go into the streets and compel the lost to come to Jesus? How many of us, when we're out, we walk past that homeless man? Even though he may be asking for money, we still would not even offer him prayer. Or we would not even offer him Jesus. John 9 verse 4 says that I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Because the night is coming when no man can work. And how many of us know that night is surely coming real, real soon? So what are we doing while the sun is up? And I'm not just talking about night being when Jesus is coming but night for our individual lives. God is calling for us to get busy. 
There is much work for us to do in this last hour. There are a lot of people who need to know that there is a God who loves them. Time is running out and souls hang in the balance. The Bible says that hell is enlarging her borders every day. So why do we think that hell is enlarging her, her borders every day? So who is going there? Lost souls. What are we going to do about that? Some people woke up this morning and their alarms are still going off because their voices are now hushed in death. There are some people who were alive before service started and their voices are now hushed in death. Oh, that we would realize the seriousness of our times. Oh, that we would realize that time is short and that time is running out. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 16 says, See that, see then that he walks circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We cannot be foolish with the time that we have. We must make most of what we have left, saints. We do not know when Jesus is coming. We do not know when our own voices will be hushed in death. And only what we do for Christ will last. And I'm afraid that we are so caught up in the things of this world that we have forgotten the mission of Christ for our lives. He has given us the signs. And we see them daily. He said that when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That is why I join in with David's prayer in Psalm chapter 90, verses 12. So teach us, O God, to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We need to constantly be aware of our days so we will not waste time. In verse 22 of Luke, the 14th chapter, the servant did what was commanded of him, but there was still room. Look at your neighbor and say, there is still room. Yes, we may have prayed for someone Yes, we may have led someone to Christ. Yes, we may have invited someone to church, but there is still room. We can look around this sanctuary and see that there is still room. We can never become satisfied with where we are in God. We can never become satisfied with the souls me we, me we may win for Jesus today. The Bible says, greater works. Look at your neighbor and say, greater works. So our mindset regarding the work of the Lord should always be greater. We should always be asking God for a greater harvest of souls today than yesterday. There is always one more. Look at your neighbor and say, there is one more. Come on, I know you're talking to your neighbor a lot today, but I want to encourage us today that there is still one more. There is always one more soul that we can reach. We win one soul and then we say, I want to go on a sabbatical. We went out on the evan with the evangelism team once and now we need a break from ministry. We live in the age of weak Christians who feel that they are doing God a favor. We complain about how tired we are. We complain that church is too long. We complain that we don't want to look foolish to other people. We make all these excuses, but when we go before God and say, God, I need this and God, I need that, we want God to do it right away. But when it comes to his work, we want to give God the short end of the stick. Now, how does that work? It doesn't. That's right. We can't want to say, God, I need you to work this miracle out for me. 
God, I want this new house. I want this new car. God said, go out into the streets. Oh, God, my, my, my feet hurting today. My back hurting today. Okay, if, what if your miracle was tied up to you going out there? You just missed that miracle. And we wonder, we talking about my miracle my, is delayed. My breakthrough is delayed. I wonder why it's delayed. I thought a relationship was a two-way street. Let me get back to this. We have made the work of Jesus Christ about us. Me, me, me. But it didn't have nothing to do with us. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it, the, the scriptures tell us that it's not about us. God is calling for us to do more in these last and evil days. The Lord told his servant in verse, chapter, in verse 23 to go out into the highways and the hedges to bring in the laws that my house may be filled. This is our charge today as believers. If we want to see God's house filled, we must do the work of an evangelist. Uh, Paul told Timothy to make full proof of your ministry. We must not be afraid to let our light shine before men. The Bible says, so let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. We must not be scared to carry this glorious gospel to the ends of the earth. If we want to know why our churches aren't growing, we need to check the strength and the effectiveness of our evangelism. The house will never be failed if we never go out and reach the lost. Our conferences, our revivals, our concerts, our worship services will only fill the pews for a couple nights or a few days. Evangelism will sustain the movement of our churches. If we want to know how the churches in the New Testament thrived, it was because they had a strong evangelism. They went out. They wasn't stuck in the four walls. They were in the streets. But when we think about when we were once the one that Jesus left the 99 for, come on now, how many of us was that one? Jesus left that 99 and he found me. Come on, that song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch. Like me, I once was lost, but now I'm found. So when we think about that, we will have a greater appreciation for soul winning. There is someone's lost father, lost son, lost wife, lost aunt, waiting for us to show them the love of Jesus. When we go out into the streets, as we are reaching someone else, God is reaching the very person we are believing to receive Jesus into their hearts. What we do for others, God will do for us. We are planting seeds for our miracle. As we stand in the gap for someone else's loved one, God is working behind the scenes on ours. There is joy in soul winning. There is joy in being the answer to someone's prayer for their loved one. There is joy in seeing gang leaders break down in tears because their hearts are filled with the love of Jesus. There is joy in going on the streets and giving hope to someone who has just lost a child. There is joy in going on the streets and giving a hug to someone who feels that they are unlovable. 
Like Dr. Rod Parsley says, the apex of all Christian endeavor must become to place the jewel of a soul in the crown of our Savior that the Lamb of God slain may receive the reward of his suffering. Do we want Jesus' suffering to go in vain? So as I close this morning, may we have a burden for the lost again. May we have a passion for the lost again. May our prayer time be filled with weeping and wailing for lost souls in our community. May our pillows be drenched in tears for the hardened hearts. May we not rest until every person we know comes to Jesus. May our light shine even brighter in these dark times. May we never become complacent in God's great commission for our lives, which is to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Like an old hymn reads, there's a call comes ringing, oh, the restless way, send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save, send the light, send the light. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, and let it shine forevermore. Stand up on your feet. I know it wasn't a shouting message, but that's all right. God wants to bring our heart back to what really matters to Him, and that is souls. There are souls to rescue. There are souls to save. When we think about where this world is headed, when we think about the many people who have gone on, it makes us realize that we haven't been doing all that we could. It makes us realize that, hey, I need to do better. I need to do more because I need to work while it is day because night is coming. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. So let us do his work. Father, I thank you for the word this morning. God, you have given us a charge to go out into all the world. Give us the burden for souls, my Father. Give us that fire and that passion to do your will in these last and evil days. Let us not just hear this word, God, but let us become doers of this word. Let the passion for soul winning be ignited in our hearts again. And before I close, if there may be one who don't know the Lord this morning, we offer Christ to you. This is why we do what we do. 
If there may be one who may have said that, I have gone far from the Lord and I want to come back. We offer Christ to you. If you may be watching online, we offer Christ to you. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. He is waiting for you. There is no shame. Come to Jesus. So God, even if we may all have it together, may we do what you have called us to do, and that is to win souls. In Jesus' name, amen.